Um, so yes, as I said before, I'm Maddie Rice, um, and I also have content warnings for harassment sexuality. Um, uh, it's not going to be too explicit. I won't be showing any uh, words that should be triggering or whatever. This is the most explicit picture you'll see. Um, but I also, um, I realized uh, this is the first talk I've given after a whole bunch of um, difficult things have happened, and I realize I'm getting, I, I've been emotional this entire evening. So I also might have an emotional reaction, and if that's too much for you, I won't be offended if you have to get up and leave, so don't, don't worry. Um, and I also noticed that um, I think I'm the first person to be talking about games in particular. Um, I am not a person who comes from anywhere in computer science. Um, I know almost nothing about the tech industry besides what I hear in the news. So um, we're going to take a turn for the artistic, and I think some of this applies for technology um, as well, but I will be talking mostly about the games industry. So if I make any some wide generalizations that you find completely just offensive, it's probably because I'm talking about the games industry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we'll just leave it at that. Um, and so um, because of that, um, yes. Um, it's too late for me when it comes to the games industry. Um, I have recently uh, left the games industry. I don't feel comfortable being in the games industry and I will not contribute anymore to the games industry. This doesn't mean though that I don't create uh, games and play experiences, that I talk about them, or I talk about advocacy issues within games and play. And I want to make that distinction because I feel like right now, um, especially with kind of our first few speakers and also with a whole bunch of other um, kind of diversity in games topics, we're talking about how to get more diverse people into the industry. And I know that's a passion for a lot of people. I know that's important for a lot of people. And I want to hold that at the same time as this. But know that if I seem overwhelmingly dismal or, uh, or fed up with things, it's because my personal journey has ended. But it doesn't mean yours has to. Um, so just, just a little bit of who I am. Um, uh, for the past uh, over about three years, I've been um, mostly a games critic, meaning I wrote a critical analysis of games uh, and very often about social justice issues within uh, the games industry. Um, I've also become a game designer, uh, and I created both digital and non-digital games. Um, and I've done a lot of speaking, um, and I've also done a lot of uh, uh, conferences as well, uh, hosting conferences and things. So um, I actually come from a unique perspective, actually, uh, and which is why uh, this title is called you know, Diva Ex Machina, because I think the things that I've done in the games industry while I was in it was an intervention. It was from a perspective that was very uh, divergent and um, interdisciplinary. Um, as you can tell, I was both media and development and event organizer at the same time, as well as having some uh, a little bit of a toe in academia. So um, this is kind of what, from my perspective, um, how things are and are not working in, um, in a, a diversity in games initiatives and, and that's kind of what is going to be the basis of my talk is the idea of what is diversity in games and maybe this is also applicable to diversity in tech and kind of what I think people who are actually you know on the ground floor grassroots activists are actually doing and what they kind of actually need as opposed to what's happening. Um, I also want to give a bit of a disclaimer on myself. Um, you see this um, and I know a couple of us in the audience are probably thought about this picture, but I do want to uh, call myself out. Um, I am kind of seen as one of the more visible people when it comes to diversity in games. Um, I am an exception, I am not the rule. Um, and I say that because I don't want people to think that everyone has the ability that I do, um, and that, that my process is what others should do to obtain some sort of success or, or, or whatever that may be. Because my journey, as you can see, has been a very painful one and one that I feel like others should not go through. Um, and I also want people to, because I, I put my Twitter up, and if you didn't see, like, you know, so you can go ahead and live tweet me to keep me honest, um, is that I do speak from a place where things I say are very often tokenized and, and spread about to be the, the uh, opinion of all people who are not white men, you know? And I don't want anyone to leave this talk thinking that I speak for a group of people. Um, I speak for myself, um, and if I make any of those generalized uh, statements, to definitely hold me responsible for them. 
Um, so first, uh, a first problem is uh, that, that I want to say that diversity games tend to uh, try to tackle is how to get more diverse voices in games. And this is kind of like, you know, the number one thing, uh, you know, it, it's already been talked about, like, you know, do we, you know, how do we get, you know, recruiters out or how do we get people interested in whatever. Um, and so first, uh, this is going to be kind of a trend. I'm going to pose a question, then I'm going to pose the answer that the game, diversity in games tend to put forward, and then I'm going to put the answer that my work has probably has, uh, has signified. So for uh, diversity in games, their answer is uh, STEM, like uh, studying. Um, you, you might notice that I don't like this uh, from my creative way of, of expressing this. Um, basically, um, the, the answer is, you know, start STEM education, you know, out of the womb, you know, get it at, you know, into college, get uh, women in their 50s into STEM. It's just like everyone get, you know, STEM education, get into the tech industry, and then games will be better. Um, and so what, what this argument is to kind of, um, as you can see, my wonderful, uh, you know, slide making skills, um, is that a whole bunch of things, uh, what, what's that, that argument of get people into STEM really means is one, that numbers are ethics. It means once the numbers, however they change, do change and get to a place we want to, we've arrived to an ethical society. Um, it also means that, you know, the way that money is, uh, 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 that money, as in the way that people uh, get to these numbers, which is what funding, you know, uh, nine-year-old girls summer camp at, you know, uh, coding is the ethical thing to do. And that throwing money at all these other programs while not doing other things is a way to reach the standard. And also that companies themselves are our ethical standard, that they are the ones with uh, the money and the, the need to fill numbers. And so therefore, they are basically the gatekeeper of the ethical standard that we need. Um, and that is, I, I find that uh, whenever I see things in the news now, like Intel, you know, gives money to women in games. And I'm like, I haven't seen any, you know? So, uh, <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, so, uh, so now uh, for, for my work, um, I, you know, one of the main things that, uh, one article that I wrote um, is that technology itself is not the answer to uh, getting people, more people into games. Uh, it's actually spreading uh, and broadening the idea of what play can be is what is going to involve us. People are playing and creating games all the time, but it's not always a triple A game that, you know, is about shooting zombies, right? Like, we don't need, you know, that population par a parody in, you know, electronic arts for us to finish this problem. And so, a couple of examples I just want to read some things, like, is a, you know, uh, as a quote from this article, um, it's lo-fi digital games that do something other than fun. You know, we can, I think that people are creating things that are not necessarily fun, you know, and consumer friendly that uh, are not included, uh, that I, I think should be put into their umbrella games. You know, uh, communal play, uh, non-quantitative relationships, empathy, uh, hidden stories in reality, and, populated, and populating art exhibits and things like that. And there's a whole bunch of things I wish I could get into, but I have way too much information. Uh, and so one, uh, one solution that I, I'm just going to read this out loud is the solution is needing more weird, personal, accessible game making tools, this is specific for technology, uh, to broaden our artistic culture is to include people who make tools and give ex room for expression in them. And so right now, um, I'm pretty sure people who are familiar with like DIY tools and things probably know about Unity and things like that. I looked at Unity. And like I probably cried for a week trying to use it, and then stopped. And I can imagine that I was actually one of the people who stuck it out the longest, you know, uh, on doing that. Um, but what I found is that there's a lot more um, room for uh, tool creation to be an active expression and to help broaden what games are going to be. Things don't need to be, you know, technically, you know, impressive. Like that is such like a, you know, like a. Nintendo Magazine 1996 type, you know, thing, you know, we're in 2015, we know technical excellence does not have to be an aspect of video game creation culture. 
And so uh, I think there just needs to be more ways that we allow people to get in, but not to get in doing the usual things. You know, how about like getting them to do weird things, you know, and create tools that they have to wrestle with creatively and that they want to wrestle with, not, you know, trying to figure out how to do some multi-use purpose thing that, you know, even typical programmers can't wrap their heads around. So um, I think that that's a really important thing is that because I, I offer this because people who all do have a technical background can help. Uh, you can make weird little tools in your spare time, hopefully, you know, to, to uh, help people who can't, uh, who don't have that technical background like me. Um, if it wasn't for people who made tools, I would never have made a game ever, and that would be sad. So the next uh, question is how do we increase visibility of diverse voices? You know, how do we get more people to, you know, more people on stage speaking, how do we get them in headlines, how do we get them, you know, doing all these things. Um, and so there's, there's two ways that I see that diverse voices are uh, highlighted in the media and in the industry. One is when they're harassed, and the other is when they are financially, so I found this on there's a um, 10 most powerful women in gaming. And my, my, my favorite part is like the little caption that says most powerful women up top is like a category as if powerful women are trapped in some quantifiable way. Um, you know, uh, but, uh, and the thing is I do know people and have friends who are apparently powerful women, uh, but um, as, as, as noted by uh, this publication, but uh, it's always by industry standards. It's who's founded a company and made a whole bunch of money or who's basically risen up quicker through the tech field than anybody else, or you know, just a whole bunch of other things that someone like me would never be, I will never be a powerful woman according to you know, the standards that are put up here. Um, and I like to think I am a powerful woman you know, in my own right, but I just don't go by these standards. As well, um, we only allow people to have uh, you know, space in our culture when they're harassed, uh, you know, here's a good list of being a woman in games. Because first of all, being a diverse woman, you know, being a diverse person in games means you're a woman in games first. I don't know what that means for everyone else who's not, but um, basically, uh, here are kind of common things that I kind of see. Uh, re uh, interview requests about your abuse. Uh, for the past couple of months, I've had just, you know, uh, reporters just really want to know every you know, bit of detail I've had about the abuse I've had for the past year, um, and kind of the trauma that I have, and the things, and just these gory details of things. Um, and that is, that, that is the majority of, you know, the kind of presence I would have in the media if I was to allow that to happen. Um, this is a powerful, make, also equals makes a lot of money. Um, I haven't sold anything, like my entire involvement with games has been selling nothing. Everything I have is for free and is accessible to everyone. Um, and so my my zero dollar sign is never going to make it into 30 under 30 or whatever, you know, uh, because that's what matters. And even if you try to diversify, you know, those sorts of, uh, you know, listings and things, uh, you're going to miss, a, you know, huge swaths of people who are doing so much work. Um, and, you know, of course you're going to miss, you know, cool people. Uh, you know, and then of course after that is interview requests about how you're totally fine with the games industry. There's, a, there's another kind of like counterpoint, you know, I'm pretty sure this happens in the tech culture too, where someone's like, I've never been harassed, I don't get it, you know? And, you know, they're just waiting, you know, begging for those, so if you have those stories, I mean, just get some dollar bills for that, because people want it, you know? But um, everyone, every once in a while, people be like, yeah, like, you know, they like, you seem like a happy, wonderful person, how about you tell everyone how wonderful the games industry has been? I unfortunately turn those people away mostly because that's not true. Um, <laughs> majority of speaking gigs for is are for being women, a, a woman in game, in games, uh, and um, that is happening. Like, the majority of my speaking uh, uh, invitations at um, professional conferences have been about how I am a minority in games, uh, not necessarily about my work. Um, and not necessarily about the things I do or a whole bunch of things, just how is it to be woman in games, you know? Um, and after being some, like, I've been only in the industry for three years, but my three years has been a little bit different than other people. I've totally, you know, sped through it. Um, I've been at many speaking gigs over the, the entire 
entirety of my short, I guess, career, even though I didn't have any money. Um, but um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's tiring, because that's all other people can see you as, as that woman in games, and you know, and you become this, like, like this object of like, okay, we need to get you women in games into these demographics and we're gonna put you here and you're gonna speak about these things, yay, no, whatever. You know, it's just it's just this weird way that you are, you know, positioned and treated once you are identified as women in games. Oh uh, yeah, don't ever mention race, class, disability, any other thing that could possibly, you know, make life harder for you because um, that's uncomfortable, you know, for a lot of people. Uh, so it means you can only be a woman in games uh, while you're doing this. You can't be, you know, a woman and then, you know, have it keep going. And of course, bikini armor, yes or no. Yeah, and that's the thing, like, they don't let you have the or. You know, I tried doing or. I said or once and they wouldn't let me. Uh, they, and it's always like this kind of, you know, hot button topic of like, oh, you know, this game, is it bad or good? Please, through, through you know, the put down the feminist sword on, on, you know, Bayonetta or something, you know? And it's just always kind of like this weird, uh, you know, uh, kind of like, uh, what's the word I'm thinking? Kind of like, uh, like arbiter of, of judgment on things so people can don't have to think about the things that they're engaging with. Instead, they just ask you, woman in games, is this good, you know? And, you know, that's never, never something I ever liked. And so solution, uh, oh, no, no, yes, okay. So a uh, solution, so through uh, one, uh, uh, a piece on game making and local communities, I wrote, instead of answering to some larger, uh, some larger phenomena, uh, like neutral mainstream development, uh, we can look at people around us, you know, the city and country we live in, uh, and the spaces we inhabit for a source of identification. I think the things that happen to us, like women in games, is because we're trying to have this abstract thing for a field. But I can tell you uh, that East Bay game developers are radically different from San Francisco game developers, and all of us are radically, radically different from New York game developers. And it's just the people around us are already a source of difference and celebration. Um, and I actually find what was so uh, comforting to me about like you know events like these is that we invite local community members who are having local problems or local solutions to be answering because you know then we can actually all understand each other and understand our our, our issues. Um, and I think this is a really important thing because very often we go to conferences or we're expected to go to conferences that are considered like central locations. Um, we have a games developer conference, which is happening the first week of March. It is the largest game developer conference. Everyone's supposed to be there. Uh, and it means something whether you're there or not and speaking or not. Um, and the thing about it is that it's in San Francisco, but it's almost the least Bay Area-like games conference that there possibly can be. Uh, we have a vibrant outdoors and pervasive games culture here that is completely absent from the games developer conference. Uh, uh, artists who, uh, who are more well known for doing uh, you know, stuff on the margins in, who live here, like in the East Bay, are pr primarily absent from, from the conference. Uh, and so it kind of, this larger culture kind of erases local culture. And I think that's a, um, I think that's a shame. Um, and so for a solution, I actually uh, co-organized uh, an unconference. I'm not sure how, uh, universal that term is, but basically it's like a, it's where everybody get, kind of gets to speak and it's not vetted. Uh, you just come up and speak for five minutes and you get your five minutes and it doesn't matter who you are. Uh, we, uh, this is for last year. Um, actually this year we're doing it again, not, not there, but like, uh, and for completely for free, but basically this is a completely, uh, let's say, a free conference. Uh, you don't have to have any credentials to speak at it. Um, and as long as you follow our safe space rules, you belong to you know, this event. And I've heard so many things, so many different things uh, at these sort of looser conferences and it's helped build connections between people uh, that you can't have when you're speaking. Like right now, you and I are not connecting because I am speaking and giving you, not, you know, giving you knowledge from high up here. <laughs> you know? uh, but you know, when you have a little bit more of an active germinating uh, thing like lost levels, you start to notice that even if someone is an expert in a field, they're, they're talking right after someone who's completely new, but their information is 
you can't tell the difference of you know who is the expert and who's not. And I find that those sort of things are really useful. So, what exactly are diverse games? Uh, you know, this is this is where I might get in trouble. You know, talking well, the, the next few questions I'm going to definitely get in trouble by someone. But uh, this is a question that you know diversity in games people need to answer. Like, what exactly is a diverse game, and what does it mean for there to be diversity in games? Uh, and, and so for the games industry, it's mostly, you know, put a, a, you know, a woman character into a usual slot that, you know, um, uh, a man usually is in. And so this is from Last of Us. We have a young girl who is, you know, possibly queer, sorry for spoilers, but she is, um, you know, just think, you know, she comes around with a gun and, you know, interacts with things like that. You know, it's just that same image of zombie apocalypse, but now with a girl, you know, and that is kind of, tends to be, you know, the answer, that tokenization is diversity in this way. Um, and I don't believe that's the right answer, you know, because basically we don't get actual narratives or change in any other way. We just see different people. And that's great, but that means nothing else, you know, changes. So here's something I put, uh, another thing that I wrote that I feel like helps change our ideas uh, about games. Uh, you know, this uh, death of the player is kind of similar to death of the author, if people aren't familiar with any literary theory, which basically means, you know, the author's interpretation of a game does not matter. Um, and I say, well, a player's interpretation of a game does not matter, take it out. Uh, gamers are trained to expect certain things from games, like explicit rules, goals, visual quality, and of course, agency. Uh, to put it frankly, gamers are set up to be colonial forces. It is about individuality, conquering, and solving, feeling empowered and free, to, uh, 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 and free at the, ex the expense of the world. And to me, that is not my lived experience as a minoritized person. I don't get to have those feelings. You're never going to get my experience if those are the things that need to be there in games. Um, and that completely changes design as a concept if you have these sorts of, if you have that mentality. Um, I uh, play, uh, made a game, not played a game, I made the game, uh, Manichi, which is kind of uh, an explanation, uh, not an explanation, but a, a projection of, a, of an experience of mine, and it, in its design, is different to kind of echo the experiences and feelings that I feel, uh, cyclicality, uh, not having a clear choice, uh, no strong cause and effect to a winning state, you know, a whole bunch of these things that are not like, you know, uh, you know, I'm a minority and I have a bad day and oh yeah, I got my love at the end. You know, like it's not like that. It's something ingrained and different. And finally, uh, how can games aid social justice? And this is, this definitely is very contentious because right now the kind of implication of diversity in games is, oh, well, if we have a diverse set of games then we will help make society better, you know, through, through this. Um, and we usually see this through games like Gone Home, if anybody's familiar, or um, some other ones where people like seeing the narrative, like a queer narrative um, game, it was kind of an exploration game, and there you find a queer love story. Um, and th this is kind of like the better of games. There's typically games like Match 3 to Save the Rainforest, and things like that, um, which I don't agree with, is good, you know, good for impact. And this basically uh, relies on you know, the fundamental uh, you know, eat it, that consumer game, video game design will save us all. And this is not me being extravagant, this is widely pitched to businesses, you know, there, there's a whole, like, a, what do you call it, I, I spend so much time forgetting the word, oh, gamification? Uh, gamification <laughs> is basically a business model, I just really, I want to just ban the word <laughs> in my head. Um, so, <laughs> gamification is, um, basically uh, a method of game design which is pitched to other people as a consumer game design is going to save the world. And, and this is done for, you know, uh, nonprofits, done for everything. Like, yes, let's get people exercising more. Yeah, it is. Uh, I don't think it works. Um, and this is actually uh, what I think is really interesting about uh, what is coming out from uh, marginalized games. Uh, for instance, from my own personal experience, I talk about how uh, like BDSM and kink and the philosophies that are embedded in some of it kind of expand our idea uh, to affecting other people to be really quickly. If we understand that play as exercising empathy through engaging context and kink as a type of a play that deeply confronts life context, then kink practices stand as a stronger model for engaging people with meaningful play 
uh, and than the overly instrumentalized and decontextualized outlook on games propagated by contemporary game design. Uh, so this basically means that uh, we can situate games in real life and have them change instead of having some sort of abstracted model. And I did this with um, a game called Mission, which actually you can find on my, uh, on my website, that is actually um, a restaurant and pub crawl through the mission. Um, and it's basically outlined through the, uh, the, the lines, the, but those are the bus routes of the mission that bus people from you know, San Francisco to Silicon Valley. Um, and I do it so you can go around and see how gentrification is affecting eating uh, 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 opportunities in the mission because I quickly found when I tried to live in the mission for a short stint that I couldn't afford a lot of options there. Um, and I feel like if people were actually on the ground, you know, doing things in real life, uh, that we can uh, go ahead and do it. And so we're not done. I'm not saying that we are, you know, here on the old scene or have solved everything. But uh, I want to encourage people to continue thinking about these things and to question them because the games industry itself is not going to solve it and neither is our assimilation into it. Thank you.